This is Jonathan Hansen. I'm the president of World Ministries International. I want to welcome you to the Warning Television Program. Also, those that are listening to me on Warning Radio, Shortwave, watching and listening on social media, welcome. We are in the fall feast season. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles, dealing with trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Now, all of the feasts, the spring and fall feasts, all point toward Jesus Christ. Spring feasts have literally come to pass. Jesus fulfilled it. You have Passover. You know, Jesus was our Passover lamb. Unleavened bread deals with sin. Uh, we are supposed to cooperate with the Lord and allow our sin to be removed out of our life daily. First fruits, the Lord rose from the dead. We don't have to be afraid of death because he conquered death. And Pentecost, the power of God unto salvation, the spirit of God, miracles, what gives us the authority to represent him, doing what he would do on earth, miracles, signs and wonders, healings. That's what the church should be doing. The church is failing because most of the church is not doing that. Even theoretically, if they believe in it, they're not doing it. Because if we just talked before we went on the air about a spirit of familiarity, which is led by our pride, and the church is run by their pride. A, a familiar spirit is destroying everything, including relationships with people, businesses, churches, and marriages. But we're in the fall feast. Now, it changes every year, the feast seasons. Why? Because the Gregorian calendar... Is based on a sun or solar calendar. The Jewish calendar is based on the moon or lunar calendar. The solar year is 11 and a quarter days longer than the lunar year. So every year it's different. One year you might celebrate it in October, another year in September. 2021 is September. So we are into the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're talking about the Feast of Atonement today. Last week, I talked on trumpets, um, the trumpet of the Lord. You get in the book of Revelations as the trumpets are sounded. Uh, the Lord gives instructions to the angels. They blow the trumpets. The seventh trump, when the Lord returns at the battle of Armageddon, and the dead in Christ rise. Very exciting things. Uh, trumpets, the voice of God, the might of God, spiritual warfare, the horn of our salvation, you know, Joshua blew the trumpet and Jericho fell. That was an exciting discussion last week and study. Now, atonement. Atonement, we get into prayer and fasting. We get into sin, trials, healing and deliverance. God wants us to be able to handle our trials. Again, these Fall feasts deal with the second coming of Jesus Christ. What happens before the battle of Armageddon? Well, we're going to go through trials. Can you deal with these trials? And that's what atonement teaches us. Again, the feast of atonement. One aspect, if a person doesn't understand how to deal with these trials then it stops us from entering into God's rest. And, and the Feast of Atonement, God wants us to learn how to enter into his rest, to have peace in the middle of the storm. I gave an example many times. Idi Amin killed 500,000 Christians. Many missionaries fled Uganda. Uh, Idi Amin, a boat here, followed him, and, and we went right in to plant churches. And I remember sleeping in Kampala as the capital of Uganda, and uh, bullets were shooting all night all around us. Many people were awake. Uh, they were afraid, and I slept like a baby. Because I knew nothing could touch me unless God allowed it. I woke up and they said, oh, Pastor Hansen, uh, we didn't get any sleep. Uh, did, did you hear the bullets? I said, I went to sleep. How could you sleep? Because nothing can touch me unless God allowed it. Do you understand the promises of God? And I understand he does allow it. There's millions of martyrs. But I also understand there's no such thing as death. I am promoted. I live eternally. Can you handle the truth of the word of God. Can you handle death? Some people can't. They're going to backslide. They're going to take the mark of the beast. 
They're going to compromise and say anything, lie, do anything to save themselves. How do we cope with trials? We all experience difficulties which try our faith and test our obedience to the revealed will of God for our lives, all of us. How we respond to these trials often make the difference in whether or not we know the rest of God. The Day of Atonement is an aid God has given us to teach us about our Lord Jesus Christ and how to handle the inevitable, inevitable, I use, the word trials that confront every believer. It's inevitable. You will go through trials. You say, I haven't yet. Well, get ready. You will. Nobody goes through this life without trials. Eventually it will happen. We read in Leviticus the instructions concerning the Day of Atonement. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also the 10th day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day for it is the day of atonement. For any person who is not afflicted of soul on that same day, he shall be cut off from the people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. Wow. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict your souls. On the ninth day of the month at evening, from the evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Leviticus 23, 26 through 32. The book of Leviticus chapter 23, you can read all the seven feasts. But we learn from these instructions that the day of atonement, again, was on the 10th day of the month of Tishri. This was the great day of national cleansing and repentance. From what? From sin. It was on this day that God judged the sins of the entire nation. In view of this, the Day of Atonement became known as the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment is coming. Now, we all experience days of judgment, but we are talking about the Day of Judgment from the Lord to judge nations, to judge you and I for the deeds done in the body. The Day of Atonement was the one day in the year when the high priest would go behind the veil in the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Thank God for the mercy seat. I want his mercy. You want his mercy. Thank God for the mercy seat. The high priest would go behind the veil. And sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And the Lord is our high priest. In his blood, he sprinkled on the mercy seat for mercy for you and I. His blood, our high priest, Jesus Christ. We have mercy. This offering of the innocent substitutionary sacrifice made possible the atonement for the sins of the nation. The innocent. Jesus Christ, totally innocent. A lamb without blemish. The word atonement means to cover. On the great day of atonement, the sins of the nation were covered by the blood of the sacrifice. If our nation would turn back, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and repent, humble himself, and turn from their evil ways, then I would, the Bible says, Jesus, I would hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land, if we would repent as a nation. That's the only thing that will save this nation. Other than that, you better be right with God and hope the blood of Jesus Christ covers you from the death angel when judgment came upon that world power, Egypt, for their sins and they did not repent. Individually, then, they better be right with God. Individually, they better stay under the mercy seat, under the blood, and not go outside 
or they would have been struck down with the Egyptians. Trouble is coming. Because of the day of judgment, it was a time of great soul affliction. It was the day of godly sorrow, godly repentance, and confession of sins. It was a time of mourning before God with a broken spirit and contrite heart. This is what we need to do, and we need to do it daily. This time of the year, we can especially let this come back to our memory and remembrance, the importance of a contrite heart, a broken spirit, of repentance, of dealing with our sins. It was the only required day of fasting in the Bible. Now, the Bible implies all through the Bible fasting. Jesus constantly got away and prayed and fasted. But this was a required day for the nation. Can you imagine if, if America truly fasted, repented? I mean, they truly did with a contrite heart. Our nation would be saved. The Jews further believed that the day of final judgment and accounting of the soul would come on the day of atonement. On this day, the future of every individual will be sealed and the gates of heaven will be closed. In light of this belief, the Jews performed many good deeds during the 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. And they still do. This 10-day period became known as the Awesome Days or the 10 Days of Repentance. I like that. Well, we should have 365 days of repentance, right? I mean, we should be humble before the Lord and when the Holy Spirit convicts us, repent of anything. Bad attitudes, get angry with spouse. You know, maybe she didn't make the coffee. It's because in my home, I make the coffee. <laughs> but maybe she didn't make my ugali. <clears throat> That's a Kenya delicacy. Oh, she made it for my son last night. Whoo, I ate some of it. And I said, honey, you better make me some. But I, I forgive you. <laughs> we got to make sure that I'm atoned. There's no anger inside of me. They would express their concern and hope by greeting each other with a phrase, may your name be inscribed in the book of life. Boy, that's a great, great saying. May your name be inscribed in the book of life. What, that, you know, maybe we should start doing that to fellow Christians. May your name be inscribed in the book of life. Isn't that great? Wow. People would think we're radical, <clears throat> which, which we are. Jesus fulfilled the spiritual aspects of the day of atonement. He went into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood, which he shed for the sins of the world. Thank God. Thank God. We have been forgiven and made clean once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus did what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. It didn't just cover our sins. It took them away to be remembered no more. That's why I said if, if we truly repent, then there's no need to be condemned. If you're condemned, that, that's not from the Lord. That's from the evil one. That's from evil spirits or evil people. That, that don't understand the mercy and grace of God and what restoration is all about. That's why we should not, when somebody repents, ever hold it against them or bring it up to them again. It should be over. Now, we receive this great blessing of forgiveness once and for all when we repent of our sins with a broken and contrite spirit. We accept Jesus as an innocent substitutionary sacrifice who died in our place. At that moment, our future is sealed by the Holy Spirit and our names are inscribed, recorded in the Lamb's book of life. This is the finished work of redemption and salvation regarding our position before the Lord. Even though God has given us, forgiven us, and given us eternal life, forgiven us of our sins, this does not mean that we do not need a continuous cleansing in our daily lives. We are in the process of 
sanctification, but we are none of us totally sanctified, justified, but we are working out our salvation and hopefully with fear and trembling. Because if you think you are fully sanctified, just ask your spouse. They will very clearly say, not yet. I don't think they have to even think about it. Uh, am I fully? No. no. <laughs> it's just that fast. You, you can't even finish the sentence. No, you're not. <laughs> if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's what the Lord said. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. Get this one with another. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if our relationship is strong with God, it can be good with one another. It should be good with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Oh, hallelujah. That's why every night before I go to bed, I can get a great big kiss. Because if my relationship is strong, if my wife's relationship is strong, whoo! No little nonsense gets in our way. We look at each other and say, honey, I forgave you and you forgive me. Now pucker up. <laughs> Amen. 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 Marriage can be sweet. Yes. It should be sweet. Yes. And the bedroom and the bed should be the sweetest. Mm. Come on. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're all grown up here. There ain't no little baby. But if it's sweet enough, you might have a baby. <laughs> because that is a blessings of a healthy marriage is fruit. Yes. It's a harvest. Yes. God promised it to you. Come on. Yes. You bet he did. Amen. If, and if your wound is barren, heal that wound in Jesus name. Amen. Right now, heal it. Father God, if, if a wound is barren and there's, there's a problem with relationship, Ask one another and ask God to forgive you and you will be pregnant right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. That just, the spirit of God just came upon me that way prophetically. And I guarantee you somebody watching this is going to get pregnant now. Yeah. I will promise you that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 6 through 9. Oh, hallelujah. One of the ways that God works this in us is through the trials of life. We don't like it. None of us do, but God uses this. The trials of life... <laughs> To test our faith and draw us closer to God. God uses these trials to purify our motives and actions. So that we might be more and more conformed to the moral character of Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? You know, I got to always remind myself if things are wherever, wherever out there. Let's say in relationships with Outside family and friends. He uses trials to conform me into his likeness, his character. So I can understand my failures, deal with them, and become more like Christ, even in long suffering, even in mercy, even in forgiveness. He uses our trials to deal with our own character or our stubbornness or our pride to deal with a familiar spirit in us that caused problems with other people. Jesus purifies his bride. Jesus himself experienced great trials. These were not for the purpose of cleansing and purifying Jesus. He didn't need that. He was perfect. His trials were tests of obedience that forced him to constantly rely on the Heavenly Father and seek him through prayer and fasting. Jesus constantly got away 
to talk with God in prayer and fasting because he came in the form of man. He got away constantly to have fellowship with the Father. We need to do this on a regular basis. <laughs> and confession is good for the soul. I used to do a lot of it. Now my, my wife does more than I do, fasting. So I need to do more. See, I just convicted myself with my own sermon. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, amen. We all need to consistently probably do more prayer and fasting. I do. We all probably do. Jesus purifies his bride, the church, by baptizing us in fiery trials of our faith. That's how he purifies us. The purpose is to force us to earnestly seek God through prayer and fasting. Through prayer and fasting. You say, I, man, I can't resolve this situation with whoever in my family for 20 years. Have you tried prayer and fasting? John spoke of Jesus as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He also spoke and said that Jesus would baptize us with fire. Luke 3, 16 and 17, John stated, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His windowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. God wants to purify all of our stubbornness, our ugliness, our unforgiveness, our, our pride. And he wants to deal with those areas in our life that, that hurt our relationship with him and others. He wants to deal with us. He wants to burn it up. Jesus experiences baptism in fire and promised that all who follow him would do likewise. You say, well, you know, when I, when I accepted Christ, and now, now all of a sudden things are, are becoming tough. That's because now the Lord wants to make you into his image, where before you're in the image of the devil and he doesn't need to purify, purify you. He's already got you. But now you're going to be made in the image of God. He wants to purify you. The trials of our faith to deal with our pride. All of us. We learn from the conversation Jesus had with the mother of the two of his disciples. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her son, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one at your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. See, they did not even comprehend the depths of that question. They didn't even comprehend it. So he said to them, you indeed will drink my cup. See, we don't comprehend maybe the trials we're going to go through, but God is going to purify us, yes. whether we like it or not. So get ready for the ride. Well. <laughs> you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but is for those who the Lord, my father, has prepared. Matthew 20, 20 through 23. God, the Father, will see who is worthy. This woman wanted to, her two sons, James and John, to have the highest position in Jesus' kingdom. Well, that's what mothers do. They want the best. But she was not aware of the price one must pay for such honor. Jesus said the price was to drink from the cup of baptism, which he was to drink from, which was pretty heavy. This cup was the great trial and testing. 
he experienced a short time later as well, this cup. He was to endure on the cross great suffering. He became our sin bearer and was separated from the heavenly father. Separated. Just before his arrest, Jesus had gone to the garden of Gethsemane to pray. This was the greatest time of trial and testing. As he contemplated going to the cross and being separated from his heavenly father, his soul became greatly distressed. He took Peter, James, and John with him, hoping they would comfort him. He even said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Matthew 26, 38. Then Jesus went a little further by himself and began to cry out to God. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. Jesus constantly was putting his will aside for the will of the father. That's what he asks of you and me. This was such a heavy trial for Jesus. In agony, he sweat great drops of blood. Luke twenty-two forty-four. That means he was going through such dis emotional distress is what uh, the doctors will tell you. He cried out in desperation for God, take this cup if you can, Lord. In other words, if it's your will, take it away. Knowing all along this was not possible. Sometimes we pray knowing all along our prayer is wrong, but we pray anyway. The key is let us be faithful in our praying if we don't get what we want. Jesus would have gladly, if the Lord changed his mind at the last moment, done it another way, but God did not change his mind and he had to die on the cross. And that's the key. Are we willing to obey the will of God all the way? He acknowledged the Father's will for his life and surrendered in total obedience to it. Jesus then went to give up his life in fulfillment of the spiritual reality of the Day of Atonement. That's the key. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, enabling him to minister in the power of God. We too must be filled with the Holy Spirit for the same purpose. After Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, he immediately encountered spiritual warfare and many trials to test his faith. And so do you and I. Jesus conquered them. We can conquer them. We have the same power available. The Holy Spirit given to us to do the impossible and to represent him on earth as his ambassador. May God richly bless you.